I'm on a mission to help high flyers just like yourself, who until now have let the fear of public speaking hold them back from making a bigger impact. Join me as I find out the secret source from the world's leading speakers to make your speeches more interesting, enjoyable to give, and impactful for your audience. That's the mission, and this podcast will get you there. My name's Victor Ahipeni, and this is the Public Speaking Secrets Podcast. Speaker Nation, what's happening? Welcome to another episode of Public Speaking Secrets. I'm your host, Victor Ahipeni, and today we have Nick Bowditch, who's a TEDx speaker and author, and he is the only person in Asia Pacific to have worked both at Facebook and Twitter and he's a thought leader which is what we're going to jump into not necessarily the thought leader side of things uh, but on how he has become that using storytelling as a tool welcome to the show Nick thank you mate it's great to be here look how uh, first off I know there's a lot of people just their heads are spinning at the words Facebook and Twitter in the same sentence how (laughs) how did you become kind of that uh, go. How did how did you a manage to to get into both of those organisations, and then how how have you been able to spin out of that into kind of the author speaker role? Yeah, so it's been a great positioning thing for me to be to be totally sort of blunt and honest about it. But coming into it, I I, I came from a tech sort of startup background. I had a few um, few of my small businesses businesses and startups coming in, and then I the last one was an agency in which I helped other small businesses um, get going and build and grow using Facebook um, largely. And at this was at the time where no one else was really kind of using it in that way. And, um, and we were just sort of doing things a little bit differently. And we sort of came to the attention of Facebook and, and they were looking to build out a small business team in this part of the world. Um, and they never had a team. Here. They only had um, a very small sales team here at the time based in Sydney and Singapore. And anyway, so I was doing a bit of public speaking at the time, speaking at events and stuff. And uh, a fellow came out to uh, speak at the same event that I was speaking on and introduced himself. And, uh, and we got talking from there. And then he was aware of the work that I'd done and, and, and you know, brands that I'd helped and, and all that sort of stuff. And then um, it came to pass that he's like, you know, we, we really want to build out this team in small business uh, in Asia, in Australia, New Zealand, and we'd love you to be sort of the man. What, what they wanted was somebody who was already recognized as somebody who knew stuff about Facebook and small business. They didn't want to sort of parachute someone in and then tell the Australian market that they were the Australian Facebook guy. They kind of wanted to reverse engineer it. So that's how they came to ask me. And it was, it was just a great opportunity. I I stayed there for um, about three and a half years and, um, and it was, and it was great. I loved every, every day of it, every second of it, I learned something new and it was, it was really good. And then when I left, I kind of did nothing for a little while. I was, um, I just relaxed and I've, I've got small kids, as you know, and they were very small then. And so I spent a lot of time with them and then, I rebounded out of that into working um, at Twitter, doing the same sort of thing. So they um, they approached me through LinkedIn, ironically enough, yeah. and uh, and asked me. And they said the same thing. You know, we're, we're building out a small business team. Um, you know, we're a couple of years behind Facebook in in kind of the market and the market sort of uh, how how the market perceives us and stuff like that. And so you know, we really want someone to come in and just kind of copy and paste what I did at Facebook to build out that, that, that team. And, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, we can do that. You know, I was a big fan of Twitter at the time. And, and, uh, and when I was at Facebook, I was one of very few Facebook employees who used Twitter um, or, or knew anything about it. So it was kind of a nice little uh, synergy. And then, yeah, so that's how it came to be. And then that positioning statement that you mentioned at the start, Victor, about, you know, uh, the only guy in, um, Asia Pacific or the South Hemisphere or whatever, however you want to say it, that's yeah. worked at both brands and the only person in the world to work in both brands in marketing, that, that fairy dust will eventually wear off and, and somebody else is going to be that, you know? Yeah. But, um, but it's been a great um, marketing and, and uh, personal branding 
positioning statement and tool for me um, in the last few years since I left Twitter uh, to position myself as a speaker and, and an expert in in that sort of stuff and, and, and how storytelling can help brands, big and small, achieve um, and grow on both of those platforms. Yeah. Before before we jump into the the um, the, the storytelling side of things, when it mm. when it comes to, I mean, it sounds like you were doing speaking gigs prior to speaking gigs after. Um, how did you? I mean, there's a lot of aspiring speakers out there out there listening, and I think you kind of gave a good a good uh, gem there on how people can utilize what they're already doing to position themselves extremely yeah. well uh yeah with the right wording and it's not a lie it, it's just how you can you know put yeah. yourself as as that unique person but when it comes to actually putting yourself out there for speaking gigs um and then i guess pricing yourself because i've followed you for a while and i know that you're very transparent with with a lot of that uh with mm. pricing and that side of things how what, what kind of words of wisdom would you throw out to the the speakers just starting out or looking to get their foot in there? yeah oh, look i know that we both get this same question from people who are starting out you know do i do free stuff if i don't do free stuff i don't get the work if i don't get the work i don't get the experience if i don't get the experience i can't get the work you know uh, that that kind of um merry-go-round is yeah. is pretty real um Oh, I, I'll just tell you how I did it. I, I don't, I'm an expert in how I did it. I'm not really an expert <laughs> in how anybody else should do it. But how I did it was I used to do stuff for free um, at first until I sort of got you know, a bit of stagecraft and a bit of a name and, and, and stuff like that. And then I very quickly um, escalated up through charging to what I charge now um, only because I feel like I, I felt like I had done that kind of apprenticeship of you know the free tuesday night gig at the rotary club sort of thing which is which is you know it's fine work it's, it's still an engaged audience and all that it doesn't have to be a ten thousand seat stadium it's still really great work you know and um so but i done all that and i felt like i wanted to charge i knew what i wanted to charge Mm. And and you mentioned my transparency around charging, and and I'm one of very very few speakers who who has their price on their website, you know, um, because I don't know why. I think I think we're a bit either this a tall poppy thing, or we don't really want to say, and we want to be able to negotiate. Um, I I just feel like I don't want to negotiate. I feel like I've done the work, um, and my price is the price for a reason. And and in having that transparently there in black and white it actually saves a lot of really awkward weird conversations with people about oh how much what's your budget and or could you do it for this and could you do it for that i I just i just don't i do it for what it is and 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 if you if you can't afford that that's okay for both of us we're going to miss out on each other and that's a shame but that's that's what my price is and i feel like you know if you have to buy a jar of Vegemite at Coles, it's $2.69. Yeah, yeah. And that's what it is. You can't haggle about it. It's just what it is. And it's, it's that price for a reason. So, yeah. yeah. And you got to bring your own plastic bag. Um, and Absolutely. <laughs> with, with all of that, what does, um, what does speaking make up of your, your, say, your week, month, and year nowadays? Like, a, 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 obviously, being a, you know, a somewhat professional speaker or doing a lot of paid speaking gigs, it's, I guess, an art of balancing, you know, doing yeah, other business activities and writing and speaking and, and mentoring and things like that. How, how have you yeah. managed to about that? Mate, I would love to tell you that I've got a very shiny spreadsheet that all works out very well, but uh, that would be a lie. Um, I, I try to limit my speaking engagements to four a month, um, primarily because of the travel involved um, with them, even if it's just to Brisbane or just to moment I'm based around Sydney. So, you know, there's still travel away from my family, away from my home, away from, you know, my own bed and, mm. and all of that stuff. And that has to be sort of taken into into account. Um, so in terms of say revenue, um, it's, it's, it's the biggest part of my total revenue is comes from speaking, but I find that I sell a lot of books through speaking gigs and I get a lot of speaking bookings through my books. Mm. 
Yes. So it's, it's kind of, they're kind of a business card for each other mm. um, in some ways. And I do a little bit of consulting here and there, but not much. Um, so it's really my, my, my job, I guess, if you want to say it like that, is, is my job is a speaker and, and, I, and I write books. Um, and it's a real balance to not just say yes to everything, but I find the pricing helps on that. But I still say no to certain things. There's some, some brands and some industries that I just won't, I just won't work with um, for, for my own reasons. And, and that doesn't stop them asking me, but it just stops me saying yes. And so I've learned to say no to things that I don't feel comfortable doing. And, and that, that kind of thins it out a bit too. Yeah, I think I think that's a, an awesome position to A, B in, but everyone's in that position regardless. Like, you know, it, whether you're needing the money or wanting the money or whatever, you can still say no to these different industries, which is... Yeah, and it's hard, right? I, I mean, yeah, you know, I'm in a, in a position now where I can say no and not think, oh, shit, I can't, how am I going to pay the mortgage if I say no, or, you know, whatever it is. Um, but I wasn't always, and... and and I still made the decision to not work with some brands and some organizations or do some types of gigs because it detracted from my brand. Like um, not because of some pious ideology or, or anything like that. Just, you know, I just didn't want to do that work. Mm. And I knew that sometimes I really needed the money. <laughs> um, and, but I still said no. And it's, and it is really hard to say no. Um, but it, the more you say no, the more things come to you, which are easier to say yes to. I, I guarantee that. So it's, yeah. And that, and that's a piece of, piece of gold there. With, with your books that you've written, and I'm happy for you to give them a plug and, and a bit of background about what, what they are about. But when it comes to tying that into your speaking side of things, you said it's obviously like a business card and it kind of, you know, one, one rolls out to the next. Was there a time where you, when you were obviously speaking before you had a book? Was there? Did you know? Was did you notice more opportunities coming about? You know, directly because of that book. Um, when it um, yeah. Look, I'll, I won't flog my books other than to say, if you go on Amazon and search my name, you'll you'll see yeah. my books. Um, or if you go to my website and click on books, you'll see them there too. Um, I, I I was a speaker first. Um, and the stuff that I mostly spoke about, which was, you know, uh, online marketing or, or social branding and, and things like that, uh, you know, tech, startup, that kind of thing, which, is, which was my background and, and whatever, um, they didn't really lend themselves very well to the books that I wrote anyway, because the books that I've written, the two books, the one which is a bestseller and the one which is just recently out, um, are more about my own sort of personal development stuff. So... It hasn't, they haven't necessarily married that well in, in that way. Um, but I would say that the more, the more books I've sold or the more books that have been in people's hands, the more people who've come to my speaking gigs and brought them, say, mm. uh, for me to sign them or, or, or just have thought, oh, I've read that dude's book. I see he's speaking of this thing. I'll go. Like, I know that happens a lot because people say that to me. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, look, it's the books definitely, well, writing definitely exposes me as a speaker to different people who wouldn't necessarily be exposed to me otherwise. Um, likewise, um, so to speak, to, to people, you know, who uh, they might have read something or be a, uh, read something by a similar author to me and then uh, they somehow find me um, through Google or through Amazon, you know, you might like this too, which is a great, great tool. Um, and then they end up at my speaking gig. So it's just a really nice little complimentary adjunct, really. And I, I, feel, I feel like speakers who don't have, this is a bit controversial maybe, but I feel like speakers who don't have something to adjunct their speaking career with are just missing an opportunity. That's, that's all. I don't, I don't mean they all have to be speakers or they all have to have like the, the seven day program that they sell or, you know, whatever it might be, the subscription website, but the ones that do, I think for the people who are interested in it, it's a really nice little bonus. And, and, uh, you know, I, I just think it works well. Um, it's nice to have to give people another option to like something else of yours. If they've liked you as a speaker. Yeah. I think every, every event I've been to, if I've liked the speaker, I'll, 
yeah, particularly if it's a, a yeah a cheaper event or something like that. Like it's a nice way to give back to the speaker. You're like oh, I enjoyed yeah. that person, I'll get their book, um, and yeah, I'll add it to the fifty eight other books that I have to read. But you eventually, yeah, get yeah. It and then it reminds you. Like I like you say, uh, I. I'm very, very passionate about a making speaking not boring and getting more people out there to be able to share their message because it's I would have never come across you had you had not been a speaker at a couple of event, mm. of, of events and I mean since then I've kind of followed your journey and and yeah seen seen different things as they they've unfolded but I want to dive into a little bit of you as a speaker. Um, a lot, a lot, yeah. You know, we've talked about you know, you're speaking up there and Facebook coming up to you and, and saying, Hey, you know, let's, let's have a chat, let's have a meeting. But at that stage, were you still wearing the same things as you wear today? Has that always been your yeah. attire? <laughs> yeah, it's always been my, uh, my shtick, really. Um, so uh, you're alluding, I think, to yeah. the fact that I don't dress in a suit and tie when I, when I speak on stage. Um, I, I dress as me and, and I feel like. That's a real. That's always been a real brand decision for me, um, not in a in a kind of vacuous or or um, cynical way. I just feel like if I wear a suit and tie, I hate it for a start. I hate every second of it, and I just feel like that's a lie. Mm. I feel like that's not a true, authentic, engaging representation of me. If you meet me, and we, you and I met at an event where I was on stage and, and whatever. So that, that first time you saw me work, if I was in a suit and tie then, and now you know me as not that guy, one of those things is a lie. Either I'm lying to you now or I was lying to you then. And I just, I don't like that. I would rather just give you and everybody else an authentic representation of me and you can take me or leave me. It's, a, it's probably why that I think I, well, A, you're, you're a great speaker, but I think that's why I resonated as... I hate wearing long pants. I wear shorts every day. That's yeah. why I'm in Queensland. I wear shorts every day. I hate wearing shoes. Um, yeah, you're out there, and uh, I'll, I'll drop the Aussie slang in thongs and uh, and and you know uh, I can't remember shorts or, or jeans and a t-shirt or yeah it was all yeah it would have been jeans and a t-shirt I would say yeah so and, and that's pretty um, much that's pretty uh, yeah I resonate with that in the sense I'll go to a networking event if people don't want to talk to me because I'm not wearing a suit and tie then I probably don't want to talk to them either which is I, 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 exactly and then you know it's just the same as if you are a suit and tie guy so I, I look I work with a lot of startups and as an investor and advisor in little startups all over the world now actually but mostly in Australia and New Zealand and you know, sometimes we grab uh, some corporate dude or corporate lady uh, and put them in the CEO role of the startup and then make them go to some conference and wear a T-shirt, you know, and, and they hate it. Like, it's not, it's not them any more than me in a suit is me. And so I think it's really important that it's 2018. If you can't in 2018 be who you are, dress the way you want, and and not be seen as somehow less professional or less clever, mm. then something is seriously wrong. I mean, if, and likewise, if you think that, only, that people are only smart and worthwhile and effective and investable if they're wearing a suit and tie, then there is something a bit off with you as well. <laughs> Amen to that. Um, when it comes to, and, and this is where I, I, I really love to delve into it, Storytelling. Uh, yeah, I, I listen to a lot of talks. I follow a lot of people, and yeah, I'd put you up there as one as you know one of the better storytellers when it comes to you know delivering effective message with a with a speech. And obviously, you do it with and help businesses do it as well. But are there any transferable skills that you see? from what you do yeah it's not is it just a, a nickism that that you have that hey i'm just phenomenal at doing this or is it something that you know you feel you know, storytelling that you can you know everybody can kind of cookie cutter to a degree and, and take certain learnings from it let me let me rewind one step right when i spoke a lot about um small business and startup and social media and all of that stuff it started to become evident to me that there was a lot of people starting to do that. And, and, and now of course there's, you know, there are a dime a dozen. So I wanted to kind of differentiate myself away from that. And I knew that the Facebook 
and Twitter fairy dust would eventually wear out, you know? Um, so I, th- I thought about things and changing my branding a little bit into what I could still, still speak about, but be effective and be useful in that small business space, or at least, you know, a business and conference space. And, and storytelling was something that I was always really good at. And I always thought that small businesses in particular were, were pretty terrible at, um, and, and we still are, you know, we're still not very well capable of standing up and saying, this is what we do. We're really good at it. That's why we charge this much. That's, you know, whatever it might be. And so I think that's initially how I became Australia's storytelling expert, which is a, which is a tagline, of course, like yeah. any, like any other. Um, and you know, you can't deny it. You can't, some, nobody can say, well, you're not Australian t- storytelling expert. <laughs> Somebody else is. Well, I just made it up. So you can't yeah. tell me I'm not. Yeah. Let me tell you a story um, about that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, but to answer, so that's the first thing. To answer your question, I think we all have stories in this. I think we all are natural storytellers. We're descended from natural storytellers, regardless of what your heritage is. Um, a story has kept us alive for you know, tens of thousands of years in civilizations all over the all over the world. It still is how we interact with people uh, 200 times every day. We're in a story every single time. You go and pay, you go and perpetually car, you walk into the cashier, that's a story right there with the way that he or she perceives you, the conversation that you have, the interaction, everything about it. That's, that's, the, that's a story. And that happens over and over and over again. And if you're surrounded by small children like I am, then you are stuck in story <laughs> all day and all night. Like, you know, most of the stories are kind of a bit rubbish, but, you know, they, they, still, they still go on and on. So I feel like I, I just want us to be like, I love that you said before that you just want people to be able to share their, more people to be able to share their message. And, and I'm of exactly the same mind. I feel like people say, oh, look, I don't have anything to say or I don't have, um, I didn't work at Facebook and Twitter, I don't have this experience or whatever. But everybody has a human experience and human experience is full of stories, like full of stories. Mm. And, and everybody can tell something that is engaging about something that's banal. And, and that's a human gift. That's what's, it's what sets us apart, really, in the animal kingdom, you know, is our f- ability to transfer information from one another that might seem boring but make it worthwhile and engaging and useful, and that's the, that's the ticket, you know. Um, and I just feel like we do a very poor job of that. And so at the time, and it still is, a nice little niche for me to operate in because people do have a thirst for it. Um, people want to be better at it. Uh, but also people recognize that they're not great at it and, and they want to sort of upskill in that area. And that's, that's largely what I do. And what I talk about now is, 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 and particularly then my slant is particularly on telling your own story, having, you know, having the audience be part of your own endeavor, your own enterprise, your own storytelling of your own life, which, which we are a bit reticent to do sometimes. Um, and that's a shame. I think. Yeah. And I think like what I try and do with a lot of people is get them to reframe. Are they, yeah. A lot of people are scared of the word expert, like being an expert in anything. Mm. And I'm like, man, if you, I love the 80, 20 rule. So it's like, if you 80, 20, can you teach eight out of 10 people walking down the street, something that they don't know? Like, Mm. therefore you're an expert to them. You're a subject matter expert. Yeah. There's probably, you know, if you're a, a doctor, you can, tell a lot of people about their health and there's some expert doctors who are going to know more than you but it doesn't mean that you're any less than an expert and then you know with the storytelling side of things if people then come in and tell stories that they already know about themselves that they're passionate about then all of a sudden you know what are you afraid of when you're public speaking you're an expert people want to listen to what you've got now keep them engaged and don't read it off slides for 20 minutes and then yeah, walk off stage. Yeah, I absolutely don't read off slides. But, uh, but, but I think there's two points I, I, I want to just reaffirm what you've said there. The first thing is that I don't 
I don't say that I, so I speak a lot about mental health now and personal development and stuff like that, about my own mental health, right? I, because I'm not a mental health expert, but I am a, absolutely an expert in my own mental health. Yeah. Like I talk about my own experience. I talk about my own journey, my own struggle, my own stuff ups and my own wins as well. And in doing that, the second thing that comes out of that is nobody can say, that's not right. Or nobody can challenge my content because it's <laughs> it's my experience, you know. Like I'm not saying that everybody has to do X, Y, and Z. What I'm saying is this is what I did and this was the effect that it had in my life. And I, I just think that is such a, a free year for people that we don't take very often is just tell the story of what is true for you. You know, don't, don't try and say, and, and, and I think the, the one really, really simple rule, which has helped me in this way is I try never to say on stage, I try never to say should or must, mm. because I feel like as soon as I do that, I'm in that teaching professor expert lecturing mode, which doesn't really sit with well with me or, or my audience for that matter. Yeah. So instead of that, I say things like, you know, if I was you or this is what I did, and then you can, if you speak in the eye, it just takes all of that pressure off that you're not saying you should do this or you must do that. You're just saying, you know what? This is what I did Mm. and this is what happened. Um, And I just think it's a really good thing to remember. I I love that because people don't want to be told anything like you know you have a significant other you have your kids your kids have you whatever and you say to people you need to do blah 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 versus giving them a reason to understand it and I think that's where storytelling is brilliant because it's like yeah this is what happened this is what I did this was the result and people can logically come to the conclusion themselves rather than being like oh this is what I did. This is what you have to do. And then you might get this result at the end. And it, yeah, no one likes being told what to do. Uh, so no. if they can, no. if they think that they're geniuses for coming up with it themselves, then yeah, all the, all the better you've done your job. Very, yeah, very that's right. You, you've got to have, you know, that's a great idea that you've just come up with. That <laughs> I just, you know, that sort of thing is really, uh, is the key with an audience. And I feel like, and, and, and you know, to, I can't keep reaffirming you, but like to reaffirm what, you know, what you just said then, like if you, if you say to a six-year-old, don't touch that pen, it's hot. Or if you say to a six-year-old, see when I touch that pen with my wrist here, see that mark there, it's still there today. That's because that pen was hot. Mm. And the kid's are like, oh, okay, well, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> you know, it, it, rather than, you know, if, it's like, if you say, if you've, <laughs> if you're anything like me, if you see a sign that says wet paint, I, I can't, I can't help myself, man. I just have to touch it, you know? So yeah, I just, I just feel like we don't want to be told. We want to be led. Yeah. We definitely want leadership and we definitely want somebody who is going to accept us for who we are and not lecture us. That's why the media, why mainstream media is failing mm. because all it does is talk at us mm. and tell us, and tell us, you know, what to think instead of telling us how to think. And, and I think that's a big difference. That's brilliant. I've got a couple of questions, uh, last questions to, to round off. One is just of personal interest. I, I spoke at a TEDx event last year as well. How did you, being a, a, a competent speaker, how did you find the process of the TEDx, like yeah, leading <laughs> up to it? <laughs> um, I spoke at a TEDx event in India yeah. and and I know that other people have spoken at events in Australia that were very, very different. Uh, yeah, lots of rehearsals, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Mine was not like that, although there was a lot of I, – I felt like they kind of – as a well, – this is going to sound really wanky, but as a professional speaker, I felt like they were kind of like telling me how to suck eggs a little bit. Mm. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that's, but that's because, you know, they're protecting their brand and, yeah. and all that. Totally understand that. And they don't really know. I mean, I, I can be pretty unpredictable <laughs> and, and, and pretty erratic. I'm not, as I said before, you know, I'm not a suit and tie PowerPoint guy. So, you know, they, they're taking a bit of a risk. But I, look, I just think it's a, I just think it's an interesting thing. And I, and I, I really like the disparate um, sort of talent that's involved in a day like that. And, and, 
I just love learning from other people. So I thought that was pretty cool too. Mm. Yeah, I, I love the the day of it when it's just uh, what I love about it is that everybody's got no ulterior motive. Like it's not this. Yeah, it's not this self promotion. Here's a pitch at the end of it. It's not you know some event organizer trying to make a lot of money off the back end of it or anything like that. It's just everyone just out trying to share a message massively. Yeah. Which was cool, and yeah, I was just just interested on the on the process, which I'll probably save my my one for another episode. It was it was yeah, it was interesting. We'll put it that way. It was it was fine, but interesting. Did um, you find the same thing though that they were like oh like treating you like you'd never done it before? Yeah, yeah. Like I had. To, and I was like, well, hang on. Why am I here? Like you know that you know sure yeah. That's that's kind of what I was a bit like. Oh, you know this is what I do for a living because that's how you got me to come. So maybe you should just let me do what I do for a living. Yeah, well, my mine was after speaking at another event that the MC organised one, but it was like doing rehearsals, having to hand in a, a written out speech, which was like, whoa, I haven't haven't done that since. Um, and that was like, yeah, a few weeks before, and then try and memorise. Oh God, it was yeah, it was. God, um, that would rule me out. I yeah, think, right there. Well, yeah, well, it, it, it shook a couple of a couple of the other people as well, which uh, that, that that was interesting. Um, last couple of questions. Uh, outside of your own books, what's what's your the best book you've read in the last twelve months? Oh, gee, question without notice. <laughs> um, I read a lot. I read a lot online, so I don't read. I know this is not really what an author is supposed to say, but I don't read <laughs> a lot of um, book books. Although I did read um, probably in the last twelve months, there's a book from by Kate Forsyth, who's an Aussie author, and it's called The Wild Girl. Um, it's a book, un, surprisingly, about storytelling uh, and storytellers. She uh, tells the story of the girl who was basically involved with one of the Grimm brothers, who uh, the German boys who, who wrote the um, fairy tales, Hansel and Gretel and so on, and, and how she, this girl, was actually the one who wrote most of the, of the story tell, uh, stories. So it's, it's, a, it's a novel that's based in fact and it's actually like there's a lot of crossover and stuff like that and it was really clever so it's called the wild girl by kate forsyth who's a who's a great australian author nice. um she and she's a non-fiction author who's written a little bit of fiction this is one of those books yeah. it's really great cool well, we'll link that at public speaking blueprint.com uh final question uh who is a person you'd recommend other speakers to go out and have a look at uh, you know, to either a, a great talk that they've given, or somebody who's consistently putting out good info, or yeah, you know, or a brilliant storyteller, or, or what? Oh, gee. Okay, so <laughs> um, someone I work with a lot is Andrew Griffiths. Yep. Um, he's, he's based in place. Queensland. Like yeah. yeah. Uh, on he's in Cairns, but he's all over the place, all over yeah. Queensland, always, and in the world. He, he's just come back from doing a speaking gig in Tehran, of all places. <laughs> Um, but he's, he's just a really great personable kind of speaker. Um, very, very likable, very on point, very, very well researched, really good stage craft, just a very, very, very good speaker. Uh, and the other one that I'd recommend is Gil Hicks. So, um, uh, Jill Hicks, sorry, Gillian Hicks. She's based in South Australia. She was somebody who was caught up in, um, the terrorist bombings in London, um, a seven seven, um, I mean the bus and the uh, yeah. tube, yep, uh, was bombed, and she lost both of her legs in that bombing. And she speaks a lot about resilience and forgiveness, um, and inclusiveness, um, in, in particular, including uh, inclusiveness of the people who have ultimately hurt her and her family. And then, just an amazing speaker. If you look her up on YouTube, you'll see some of the stuff she's done. But She's just so engaging and so honest and so real and it's and very, very moving stuff. She's not a speaker, like she she wasn't a speaker, I should say. Yeah. But um, but what she does now is is um speaks very, very wholeheartedly about heart-centered stuff, about forgiveness and resilience. And it's some of the best work I've ever seen anyone do on the stage. And she has amazing stagecraft, amazing presence. Um, if you or if you actually, Victor, if you link this, the talk yeah. that she did, I Wired for Wonder, which was an event that I just spoke at as well, um, you'll see her stagecraft at that is something else. It's just 
very moving and very real. I can't even explain it. I really want you to look at <laughs> it. So, um, G-I-L-L and then Hicks is her surname. There you go, everyone. That's going to be linked at publicspeakingblueprint.com. If that's not a compelling enough reason to jump over there, check out all the links that we've talked about. But no doubt, check out those talks because the way that, you know, there's, there's plenty of ways to improve your speaking, but one of them is just to see those who are doing it well doing it. And I want to thank you, Nick, for you know, you're someone who's out there actually in the trenches. You haven't just um, changed your social media profile to say that you're a professional speaker <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I appreciate that uh, but if people want to check out a bit more about you uh, and what you're up to where can they go and uh, what can they do yeah mate they can just go to nickbowdage.com.au or find me on across all the socials I'm at Nick Bowdage. brilliant well we will link all of that and it's been an absolute pleasure mate and I look forward to uh, catching up next time you're in Queensland you're very welcome see you buddy If you want to fast track your confidence and impact with public speaking, then be sure to jump over to publicspeakingblueprint.com where there's an array of free resources to help you no matter where you are on your journey to becoming a more powerful speaker. And while you're at it, jump over to Facebook and join our free community called Speaker Nation where there's a ton of other like-minded individuals just like yourself looking to level up. Thanks for listening and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss next week's episode.